recording. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to VSA Online. So it's uh, 8 p.m. GMT, and uh, I would like to welcome Ken Clarkson from IBM uh, to give his talk. So without any further delay, the floor is yours, Ken. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so so um, I'm at IBM Research. Uh, I, I live in San Francisco. I, I commute uh, as I need to to San Jose. But mostly I work with people at IBM Research in, in Yorktown Heights, New York, you know, sort of um, uh, suburban, suburban New York. Uh, although actually, in this case, uh, Shashanka Ubaru, one of my co-authors, is in uh, Austin, has an, uh, has an office at UT Austin even. And, and another a collaborator uh, lives in San Francisco. She was a, a student at UC Berkeley. She was a summer student at IBM. And she's now at uh, at OpenAI, um, you know, um, uh, contributing to our future AI masters. I guess I guess would be what her what her job is. So um, what I will talk about is uh, capacity analysis for for VSAs, and I will assume that uh, that you know I, I expect that that everybody here knows more about these things. Uh, uh, th than I do, so I won't, won't won't talk too much about about background. But just as a more or less as a notational thing, um, I and and to indicate where I'm coming from, I would say that I, I regard VSAs as representing discrete sets uh, via a single vector, and and what you can do with that single vector is do membership testing in the set, and also these uh, bundling, binding, and permuting operations. Um, where the representation starts with atomic vectors, so-called, where a given, a given vector corresponds to a given element of the set. So the set, which while I assume is, is that is being represented without loss of generality, is just the, you know, the num uh, some subset of the numbers from one to D. So that will be, which is, I use this bracket notation to indicate that set, uh, and that will be sort of the ground set, and 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 everything will be a, a subset of that. So as as I'm, I imagine you all know, there's the, a map I VSA architecture in which the atomic vectors are uniform random vectors um, with plus ones or minus ones, or what I will call sine vectors, also called Rademacher vectors and uh, and bipolar vectors. I think, um, but I I think sine vectors uh, works for me. And then there is a bundling operation of you know, coordinate-wise addition, a binding operation of coordinate-wise multiplication, and a permutation or rotation operation, which is uh, where you have a, which is R times X, where X is where R is the R is a permutation matrix. And for example, and this is all I will ever really talk about, implementing a, a big M cycle and, and recall that uh, uh, these sine vectors are M dimensional. And I, I, I hope you can see the cursor and I hope I'm not moving it around too much. Um, so, uh, so let me know if I am. And in general, actually do interrupt with uh, questions or comments or corrections or, or what have you, please, because I'm not, not entirely sure of, you know, the, you know, whether, you know, of, of, of the audience and, and what you might be uh, expecting or hoping for here. So, um, you know, there are, there are also rotations, which, where you have a big matrix mostly of zeros, but with um, you know off diagonal elements that are equal to one, and then a you know the mth row and first column has a one, and and that kind of has when you multiply that it has the effect of of rotating the coordinates in the sense that the first coordinate becomes the second, second becomes the third, last becomes the first, um, and it, we use this, this tilde notation indicating similarity which means that, um, you know, just roughly speaking that the dot product of A and B is, is large, whatever, you know, whatever large means specifically. And so if we have two atomic vectors, what we will have is that with high probability, uh, those two atomic vectors generated independently will not be similar to each other. Um, and this is a kind of blessing of, of dimensionality. So, so map by architectures, uh, you know, implement the, you can, we do have these implementations of bundling, binding and permutation and rotation, which has a number of properties, which I'm assuming that you all are, are very familiar with, um, but which in, in the notation that I'm using, 
um, comes down to things like saying that that y is similar to x bound with x bound with y, um, or more, you know, so that there's an unbundling, unbinding operation. And in the case of map i, it's actually, you know, it's um, um, uh, there's a name for it, but it, idempotent. No, it's not idempotent, but it's uh, self-inverting in in that sense that you 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 bind with x twice and you get back the original the original vector. Okay, so that's oh that's that's what I'm talking about to begin with. Now now regarding these regarding the the use of these atomic vectors as as kind of building data structures. So for one thing, we could we could represent a set x, which is a subset of the the integers from one to d, and and in that case, the the bundle just becomes um, the sum of the you know over over j in the set x of the atomic vectors associated with 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 j. So that would be s sub j. So we have we have these d atomic vectors that are all again sine vectors, and we we bundle them all together to get a representation of x. We insert some integer k into x by bundling sk with the uh, the representation of x. And then we check for membership in x by checking for the similarity of sj with uh, with s of x. So so that in a in in a in a in a very brief nutshell is is a is a, a we have a data structure, it's a vector, we use that vector to insert uh, members into a set, and then we can check membership in that set using using that uh, representation sorry was there was there something or no okay, all, or, or no all okay good. oh please no everything's fine. sorry okay okay so so we can also represent a set of subsets and here um, where we were you know we look at a set of unordered subsets of of, of of one to D of size n that is you know we could we could call that a, a subset of the set D choose N, and and we could represent that um, you know effectively using a bundle of binding. So we bind together the the elements of the set of the set little e, which is a, and then we bundle together those bindings over all of the little e that are in this set big e. So in the case of uh, uh, n equals two, so we have just unordered pairs. Being represented in, you know, as a we have a set of unordered pairs corresponding to the edge set of an undirected graph. For example, we have S J uh, similar to um, what what we're looking for in for membership would be to say that S J is similar to S I bound with uh, uh, S S of E. So we can we be, because of the the properties of bundling and binding, at multi binding with S I kind of kind of frees up the, the, the binding of SI and SJ to have a kind of a free SJ that is then summed with a number of terms, which all of which are not similar to anything uh, into to any atomic vector. And therefore, um, if we can then look for SJ in as, as an atomic vector, and if, if SJ, um, if we don't find an, an SJ, then, then IJ is not in the set, and if we do find it, then IJ is in, in the set. Um, and, and finally, ordered lists can be represented as bundles of, of um, rotations of, of, of sequences of, uh, of, of atomic vectors. So in that case, we would test for membership by looking for, for SI to be similar. Membership of uh, element I in position K would correspond to sine vector I being similar to r to the minus k, uh, which is or um, yeah, uh, uh, which is just comes comes from uh, tra uh, transpose um, times s of k. So we can we can with a with a fairly simple operation, or you know, just rotating basically, not 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 actually instantiating any of these uh, in any of these very sparse matrices. We then have this uh, a, a way of checking for membership. So, so the, the, you know, the, there are there are data structures for for doing these things that uh, in you know in you know in in, in el elementary algorithms classes and so on that you know that that you know so the question is why are we interested 
in, in having this particular representation using atomic vectors and so on. And the best of my understanding of this is that, that first of all, this is a, you, by this means, we have a very distributed set of operations and including, you know, especially with a set of subsets, we have an, an associative memory. It's robust to errors of computation. It's amenable to in-memory computation. And it's, it's related to operations that we believe are, are you know, occur in biological organisms it's in, in, in um, natural neural networks. So, so these are some reasons for this to be of interest. They're also related to um, hop field networks and, and other kinds of auto-associative uh, networks. And, and just incidentally, I will mention, because I did some time um, designing wireless base stations, they're, they're, the, the technique of using this kind of approximate orthogonality or lack of similarity of random vectors in high dimension um, is, uh, has also been used in, in, in spread spectrum wireless. In the, in, in the phone that you have in your pocket, they're, they're doing that kind of operation there. So, so just as a, as, a, as a point of interest. So... Uh, any questions at this point? I, I'm 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 assuming at this point that I'm I bored you with things you already know about. If if putting them in odd notation, um, so okay. Um, so the 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 observation that is not for, that is not quite novel to this work uh, the the work of Thomas uh, Desgupta and Rossing is you know this is basically a follow up to to their work in in various directions, but, but a, a, a particular point of view, which is helpful here, is that we can, we can regard um, what, what VSAs do actually as dimensionality reduction. And it, there was, I did actually have a conceptual problem here in the sense that, that, that VSAs are, are very often mentioned in the context of hyperdimensional and big vectors and, you know, or, or you know, and so on. But if we if we think of it as that we're starting out with characteristic vectors of a set, then then what we're doing, as I will as I will show you know formally or you know indicate formally, is we're actually doing dimensionality reduction reduction on those characteristic vectors. So what a characteristic vector in some communities this would be called one hot encodings. Um, it, it amounts to saying that you have a binary vector, a vector of zero, you know. With elements zero and one in d dimensions, so that um, you represent a set X by having a one in the ith position if 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 i is in the set and zero otherwise. Okay, so so that's that c of X. That's the characteristic vector of the set X. That's that is a perfectly reasonable representation for a variety of purposes. Um, it has its own disadvantages, but it, it is a reasonable representation. But 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 now um, let's take the the sign vectors that are the d atomic vectors of a VSA architecture for representing this this set of subsets of, of one to d, and and arrange them as the columns of a matrix. So the result is so we have s there, it comprises s one s two up to s d. So this is some plus ones and minus ones and and overall and because. Because of the independence of uh, the of the generation of these things, we, we have we have each entry is is uh, independently identically distributed, identical just it's just you know plus one or minus one with equal probability. So we have one big um, sign matrix, as as they're called in the in the theoretical computer science literature. So one tweak to this that I will give is that I will. I will scale this by one over the square root of the number of rows um, and, and, and generally talk about that representation because it has some, has some kind of advantages in terms of the statements that I then make with it. Um, and, and now we could say that, you know, especially including that, that, that scaling and, or ignoring that scaling, if you like, that the, that the representation that I gave in the, in the previous slides um, using bundling and of atomic vectors and so on could also be expressed just as s bar s or s bar times the characteristic vector. So, so if the if the number of elements of the ground set is much larger than the dimensionality of the of the VSA architecture, then we are actually doing you know dimensionality reduction of this characteristic vector 
down to a VSA vector. Okay, so this compresses this, this sparse characteristic vector down to S bar times C of X, which is, you know, integers and then, and then that scaling business. Okay, so, so now the membership test in this case be, looks at the dot product of an atomic vector with, with that representation S of X. And again, I, you know, just don't, you know, the, there is the scalings there that I put in, but, but uh, we, we could regard this as S bar, this, this atomic vector, we could call it S bar times the ith natural basis vector E sub I, um, the one hot encoding of I, and and the the dot product we we take the tran we could it's the transpose of of this um, uh, of this atomic vector or or sketch of E I times this uh, representation or sketch of the characteristic vector, and if we just you know apply the properties of the transpose, we have something in which you have the we have the natural basis vector transpose times S bar transpose S bar times the characteristic vector, which is to say that we have this, this, this product, which is an approximation to, to the dot product of E sub I um, with, with C of X. That is the, and the scaling here is done such that indeed we have this, we have this approximation. The, the intention, the intention of the scaling is to allow us to be able to say things like that. So, so we are doing a species of dimensionality reduction using these, these random vectors. And not only can we do set, intersect, uh, set membership in this way, but um, we could also, if we were to look at the, the size of the intersection of two sets X and Y, th that corresponds to the dot product of their characteristic vectors. So V the characteristic vector of, of X and W the characteristic vector of Y, and, and then the cardinality of the intersection of those sets is approximately equal to V transpose times S bar transpose S bar times W. So, so again, we're, 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 we're saying that this dot product is approximated by this, this product, which, is, which could also be regarded as the dot product of, of, of you know, S bar times V with S bar, the, you know, dot, the, take the dot product of that with S bar times W. So, so I will probably call these I, I will these sketches of V and W that that when the and so the the statement would be that the dot product of the sketches is approximately equal to the to the dot product of of, of the original vectors V V and W. Similarly, the the um, the cardinality of the difference between these two sets um, could could be we could express that exactly as the uh, squared Euclidean norm of the difference of these two sets of these two vectors because they're zero one vectors, and um, that is approximately equal to the squared norm of the of the you know, difference of the sketches of those two vectors, which we, we could again represent as a as a as a as a dot product. So here again, we're 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 saying that that the 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 uh, squared norm of, of this vector V minus W can, or, you know, the dot product of that vector with itself can be expressed, can be approximated using these, these uh, this sketching notation. And so we can, in this sense, kind of extend the way we think of what uh, VSAs do to include set intersection and, and set difference. So okay. any, any, answer... any comments? Yes, please. Uh, ask a question just for clarity. So the, in this limit where the uh, number, the D is much larger than the M, these atomic vectors are then uh, linearly dependent, right? Who's, who's, who's linearly dependent, sorry? So the, these different atomic vectors, these S1 to SD mm -hmm. would then become, they're no longer independent, right? So, so, so they're, at least in, in, in this map I, in the map I architecture, SI is 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 um, generated independently. S one is generated independently of S two, is gen and so on, right? Yeah. So, so um, uh, so you, you're saying, you're saying, is there any I mean, if if it, the number of you know the length of the column is, is smaller, there isn't really more room to make 
so many independent vectors, right? Is that why the compression is possible, or, or do I totally misunderstand? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so the yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I have a brief intuition of why the compression is well. I, the compression is possible because one one version of that is that if you if if you uh, you know you're comfortable with the idea that the that uh, the sine vectors um, are approximately independent of approximately orthogonal to each other. Right, that that's you know. So if, yeah. if you were to if you were to expand out what what this expression is, then then basically you would be you know this this inner this s bar transpose s bar in 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 expectations it's equal to the identity matrix um, because the off diagonal terms are dot products of atomic vectors. The on diagonal terms is just the dot product of one of these vectors with itself. Mm -hmm. And the scaling is such that the, you know, we have an expectation of this being the identity. Um, and, 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 and actually it's even true, you know, kind of approximately true with high probability that it's close to the identity or, you know, that's, it's, it's true with high probability that it, that, that, that product is close to the identity. And therefore, you know, I'm, I can, I can almost say that it's, it's, you know, E sub I transpose times C of X. It's the, it's the original vectors dotted with each other, plus plus an error term based on you know just how 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 well you're how much you're able to say that these things are approximately orthogonal to each other. Does it does that help? Well, I'm just confused by the the by this d much larger than m. Let, let's say m is just two, right? So you have uh, plus one plus one, you know, plus one minus one minus one plus one and minus one minus one as the only possible vectors. So if you right. have a lot of vectors, they must oh. be linearly dependent, right? Or is it... oh well, so so m m d is much larger than m, but m can't be tiny. I mean, m m m has to be large relative, for example, to the not, not to d, not to the number of possible elements in the set, but but relative to the to the actual number of sets represented. Uh -huh. So you know so the number got of to be ones. Some other... and, there's some other boundary yeah. so that yeah, doesn't yeah. get too extreme. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. All righty. Okay. All right, could I? So, yeah, I have. Oh, sorry, another question? Uh, sorry, no, it's just a, a very quick continuation. Could you go back to that previous slide, please, Ken? Sure, sure. So, just concentrating on that graph. So, then the interpretation you're saying with that M by D matrix there is that the M is the what we would normally call a, the dimensionality of the hypervectors. So the columns are our hypervectors. Uh, right. But, but D is essentially the alphabet of all possible things we might conceivably want to represent and is an yeah. absolutely ginormous number. And the, the, so you're saying that even though M might be you know, 10,000 or whatever, that it, that's that's minuscule compared to d and that's why you're referring to it as a sketch because it's 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 just for picking up some yeah. of the content okay terrific thank you yeah 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 and it, it, as i said i actually had a little bit of a conceptual barrier to that in the sense that that you know, oh these are hyper vectors these are huge vectors but but still it is possible to regard what you know what they're doing is as dimensionality reduction so yeah. yeah, and and, and in yeah. any in any in any actual problem we'd be dealing with, uh, the number of elements of D, uh, which we would be instantiated and we'd care about, would be, yeah, small. Would small in yeah. general. Yeah. yeah. So Thank the you. possible things you can represent as large, but the actual thing size of the set you can represent as small. So so you know almost almost immediately having put things in these terms. The machinery of um, you know the, the, that has been been around since you know 1984, uh, due to Johnson and Lindenstrauss, um, the or JL the random projection lemma, kind of you kind of immediately read out um, things for you know analyses of, of of bundling based on that, and and so put you know based on based on JL, what you're able to say is that if if M the the hypervector dimension is is uh, large enough, but it doesn't have to be larger than a constant factor times one over epsilon squared times the log of one over delta. That if you choose that bit an M that's big enough and and roughly that size, then what you're able to say is that the the dot product of the sketches 
um, is equal to the dot product of the original characteristic vectors plus or minus epsilon times the norm of one characteristic vector times the norm of the other characteristic vector. And this holds with a failure probability at most delta, that is with probability at least one minus delta, um, we, you will have this condition holding. Okay, and the plus or minus epsilon, I, I hope I have just will, in, I hope it's, it's clear what that, what that means. Um, so, so here the, the, the norm, the Euclidean norm of this characteristic vector P is going to be the square root of the, uh, the size of the set that's being represented. So, so in terms of, of getting some accuracy of your estimate, indeed, you, you know, there will be a dependence on the size of, the, of, of, the, of each of the sets being represented, but, um, but, but not so much on, 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 on D. In fact, I mean, there's no dependence on, on D in this expression. Okay, so, so a, a, a more classical version of the, of the, of the JL lemma says that is, is, is not in terms of um, sign matrices, the kind, of, the kind of random matrix I've been, been talking about based on the, the map by uh, atomic hypervectors, but rather uh, on, on a different kind of random matrix, namely that you generate an orthogonal matrix at random. So think of a, a gigantic random rotation, and then you take a few rows of that rotation, or equivalently, if you were operating on it, using that to represent a set of points, you would randomly rotate the set of points and then project those points down to a small dimension, down to, down to M dimensions where, you know, where M is, is in this context small. Um, then, then in that setting, there is an M, which is one over epsilon, you know, within a constant factor of one over epsilon squared times log one over delta, such that the, you know, if you take O, o sub M times V and look at the, the norm of that, squared norm of that, then you're close within one plus or minus epsilon of the uh, squared norm of, the, of, the, uh, of that vector V. So this is, this is true for, you know, for arbitrary vectors V, it's not, it's not related to V being, uh, you know, characteristic vector or anything. It's just generic, you know, true in general for any given fixed vector V that if you then generate this random matrix, then you will have this norm preservation property based on this, you know, random orthogonal matrix. So in addition to uh, psi matrices and random orthogonal matrices or sub, sub matrices of random orthogonal matrices, just picking a small number of rows, um, we, could, we, could, we could sort of define a, a matrix as having a um, single vector norm preservation property. Uh, so a, a distribution on matrices P uh, will have this property if uh, for a given Y that's in RD, it, it's approximately preserves the squared norm of, of that vector. So, um, so we kind of can generalize to say we're, we're what if, you know, one, one thing that we're, we're looking for here is approximate norm preservation. And, and that, that uh, is an extension or a generalization of the, of the original thing that the, of JL classic. And, and now, first of all, based on that single norm preservation property, um, using a union bound, you can, you can extend that to say, well, what if you have, what if you have N vectors, V1 up to VN, then you can, that same, that same matrix with, with probability, failure probability now multiplied by N um, will pres approximately preserve the norms of all of those vectors. Um, and because, because the, the, the dependence on the failure probability is only logarithmic, multiplying the failure probability by n doesn't doesn't really mean that you have that you know doesn't make you need to have that much bigger a, uh, a set of hypervectors um, and similarly you could look at given a set of points you could look at the their pairwise differences and the norms of those and and you with this this same matrix distribution you would then get approximate preservation of their norms uh, with a failure probability which is multiplied by the number of those pairs, which is at most n squared, um, and again, that doesn't doesn't hurt the doesn't increase the size of the of the dimension m that's needed by very much. And and then what another way to say this is you're approximately preserving the pairwise distances of all points in a in a set. Um, and that's that's actually the way that the the JL lemma is traditionally done. 
finally using a little bit of, you know, high school, uh, uh, you know, analytic geometry, uh, the, 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 you can express the dot product of two vectors at, in terms of uh, the, the, in terms of, of squared norms. And then if you apply the single vector norm preserva preservation property, each of these, then um, you can, you can say that you're able to preserve dot products. And indeed that's, that's what, you know, where this, this uh, expression at the top of the slide having to do with, you know, epsilon times norm of V times norm of W, where that comes from. So in particular, for if you wanted an additive error, which is less than one for, for that dot product of characteristic vectors, which means that, you know, you, you can certainly round because the dot product of characteristic vectors is going to be an integer. Um, you, you're, you're actually getting then the, the size of the intersection exactly, then you, in order to do that, you need M, which is going to be um, equal to the squared Euclidean norm of V, squared Euclidean norm of W, which is to say the, the cardinality of X, the cardinality of Y times the log of one over Delta or within a constant, constant factor of that. Okay, so, so you know, from that single vector norm preservation property, follow a number of properties all of which lead you to um, uh, 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 a situation in which uh, you, you can then state, you know, what what happens with with uh, set difference, set intersection, and and certainly also, of course, membership testing. Okay, so so that one property implies a lot of useful things, and and on the other hand, there are a variety of distributions well that are well known to have that property. So. If you extend, um, if you if you look at the so-called sub-Gaussian random variables, these are these are random variables which are, in some sense, as nice as Gaussian random variables in the sense that they're fairly well concentrated. Their their tails are not too big. Their moments are are, are not too big. Um, then then um, you know if you if you have a matrix of uh, IID sub-Gaussians then you will also have this uh, single vector norm preservation property. And that includes, of course, you know, Gaussians have that property. They're sub-Gaussian. And this uh, uniform in plus one or minus one, the sign matrices have that property or, or just uniform in, in the range minus A to A for some real number A would, would have that property. Um, perhaps more interesting, at least with respect to bundling, um, sparse JL, would uh, also has this single vector norm preservation property. This is a, a scheme in which you, you still have plus ones or minus ones, but you just sprinkle them randomly uh, into, into a matrix that's, that's otherwise zero. So, so you have many fewer, you, know, you don't have so many non-zero entries, but based on, you know, even, even so you still have this single vector norm preservation property which means that if you were only wanted to do bundling, then you could um, then then you could uh, 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 employ a, a matrix which is which is very sparse, and and still have provably good properties as a result of that. This was also observed by um, uh, uh, authors, which include with T is Thomas and D is Desgupta and R is Rossing and and some other folks. So this is not a novel observation, but it, you can, it, it's just to say this, you can read this out fairly directly from, from this, uh, putting things in this setting. Uh, another, another case here that, which may be of interest is that um, fast, what's called fast JL or one particular version of that, which is the subsampled randomized Hadamard transform uh, or, or uh, uh, it, which is to say it's a matrix which has the form P times H times D where, where D is a diagonal matrix of random plus ones or minus ones on, on the diagonal. H is a, is a Hadamard matrix. So it's plus ones or minus ones, but it's highly structured. And a given entry IJ can be, you know, the IJth entry can be read out by doing bit twiddling on the binary representations of I and J. And, um, and P, which is a, you know, applied last in a sense, which simply selects um, M rows, and it can be just selecting the first M rows, let's say, of this of this larger matrix. In in the in a, in one computational context, this is interesting because you can multiply by this matrix much faster 
then you can multiply by a random uh, IID matrix, one of these sub-Gaussian matrices. In the, in the VSA setting, it, perhaps it's interesting because at least in, for the, in the bundling case, it, you can still, you know, the, this analysis of bundling, et cetera, still applies. Um, but it's, you know, the representation is very compact. You don't need to instantiate the, these atomic vectors. Um, you can, you know, you can, re you, know, you know, kind of recover them fairly directly. Um, and, and you don't need so many random bits. So, you know, it's sort of the memory requirements of this representation and the computational requirements, I, I think, are, are milder. So, so these all just kind of read out um, from from the observation that what we are doing is is sketching. So any, I've, I perhaps lost uh, lost you at this point, but uh, any any questions or comments? Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll forge on, and I will in the interest of time I will skip the analysis. I will just you know if it's well I won't quite skip it. If if the if indeed you have a Gaussian matrix, then then the the property that the sum of Gaussians is Gaussian means that the that the sketch vector G bar times Y is is a vector of Gaussians, and then you're looking at the sum of squares of independent Gaussians, which is a chi square random variable, which has a you know has a a well known analysis. So so that you know in the case of, of Gaussians. You can you can read off how it is that you are able to use the dot product of the sketches to estimate, you know, the dot product or the you know this the squared norm of the sketch to compute the squared norm of the original vector that that falls out you know fairly readily using standard properties of, of Gaussians. Okay, one thing that I that I should mention here that I realized painfully late is that if you are um, uh, you know, this, this analysis of bundling applies in the case in which you are sort of doing the bundling offline. That is, you are presented with a set and you want to represent it and not, not necessarily a, a setting in which you, you know, you, you have, you, you build a set up by a series of bundling operations. And, and the reason for that um, is that is the possibility that some, some element will be bundled in twice and if you bundle it in twice, then then its multiplicity, you know, it will be represented with its atomic vector with the multiplicity of, you know, by which you have the number of times you bundle it in. And this analysis sort of doesn't doesn't take that possibility into account. Um, so so in, in general, to, to, to state this as a general claim about sequences of, of bundlings, you would you would have to incorporate even for membership testing. You would have to incorporate something about the possibility of, of you know, multiplicities in, in this sense that you can't you can't just arbitrarily do this this kind of thing as much as you like, um, and and then have an analysis based only on the size of the set you're representing. So so there's a certain caveat here that I have to I should you know should uh, should say. Um, now in the, in the, and I'll quickly, <laughs> fairly quickly run through, uh, a couple other things that we can do here. One is, um, uh, we could think about a bundle of bindings as a, you know, that data structure for representing a, a set of, of unordered subsets of a, of the, of the ground set. We, we could, we could, um, conceptually, uh, regard that as saying that we take a sign matrix and then we build a, a new matrix, each of whose columns is a is a binding of the of of a subset of the columns of the original sign matrix. So we have this you know this matrix which has m rows and d choose k columns uh, in order to in order to represent bundlings of 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 k wise bindings. And and so when you know we we talked about you know the the number of columns being much larger than the than the dimension. Well, here it's going to be even even yet much much that much larger than than the, than 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 the number of of, of rows. Um, and but but conceptually, we can put all of those into one big matrix, and then have a characteristic vector um, which is d choose k dimensional of of zeros and ones. And then S bar, you know, I'll call it S sup HK, 
uh, times times that gigantic characteristic vector represents that bundle of k-wise bindings of elements. So again, just you know, conceptually, we can put together this gigantic matrix and then say that we are doing dimensionality reduction on this gigantic, uh, uh, even more gigantic uh, characteristic vector. And if we do that, then we can state a, 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 a result about how, about norm preservation, which is you know, just analogous to, to those we had before, which is that there is M, which is within a constant factor of one over epsilon squared times some, some uh, log terms, such that we have approximate norm preservation for, you know, for in the case, this is in the case of uh, K equals two um, with failure probability at, 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 at most delta. So um, just as before we have single vector norm preservation and then, you know, various properties of we can take intersections of bundles of bindings, we can estimate sizes of bundles of bindings, we can do membership testing and, and the analyses will, you know, follow, follow from this single vector norm preservation property, you know, by virtue of those corollaries. And, and, but, but now in this case, the, the analysis is, is non-trivial, even, even if you already have, you know, the JL lemma in your back pocket, the, the analysis is non-trivial because the, the columns of this, of this big matrix are no longer independent of each other. So sign matrices, well, each, each column is independent of every other column. Here, that is not the case because a given, you know, a given atomic vector appears in multiple of, of the columns of this S sub H, uh, S sub uh, K rather, uh, S sub H K, as, I, as I've been trying to say. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can't simply invoke JL because it, it has certain assumptions about, about independence. Um, and so in this case, we have to invoke a little, you know, you know, typically there's some machinery about the concentration of random variables, the tail estimates of random variables like the Chebyshev bound or the Chernoff bound or Bernstein's inequality. Um, here we need to invoke a particular inequality, McDermott's inequality, which holds also for dependent random variables, such as that we end up with when we're looking um, at things in, in this setting. And we have a, a, a similar result um, for rotations where again, we end up with single vector norm preservation. And again, in the interest of time, I will, I will move over this, but the upshot is that by, you can express, you know, the, this operation of, of rotation and bundling into one single matrix. And then, sh and then we show that we have single vector norm preservation, which implies then the, the conditions that we need and, and the, if we have L sets, then we have dependence on L squared. Um, or if we, you know, what would generally be a better bound, if we know that no element appears more than K times, then we have a dependence of, on, K, on K squared for that. And I'm, these are by no means the best possible bounds. And um, I, I, I suspect, you know, could be, could be tightened and, you know, or indeed observed empirically to be, you know, with, with better results. But again, this is this is a sort of a non-trivial analysis. Again, because of a, of the lack of of um, independence, because each column, each vector that we're using, or you know, one one atomic vector gets rotated, and that becomes another column, and those two vectors are certainly no longer independent of each other. So we have a similar kind of analysis and results for map I rotations, and finally, something that I or not finally actually, well, nearly finally, but Something that I that I want to mention is is uh, that, that's actually a new VSA is well. First of all, I have an analysis of sort of a a redo of a classical analysis um, for what um, uh, you know I was told that uh, by uh, Pentix Group, uh, but the Redwood Institute is a um, uh, actually you know not not that interesting analysis because it's not kind of in the regime of the most interest. For hot field networks, but but what I want to what I want to point out is a is in our our paper is a a kind of novel uh, VSA system in which you basically in, in which the um, you, you don't have atomic vectors you have sort of say atomic matrices so you you take it, it again involves a you know you have a 
a characteristic, what will actually be a characteristic vector, you have V, you have a scaled sine matrix um, S bar, and then and then an, an, an one more twist is that there, there is a sine vector S and, um, or actually just a, ultimately what is used is a, is a sine diagonal matrix. So a matrix, a diagonal matrix whose, whose uh, non-zero entries are randomly plus ones or minus ones. And the, the theorem that we show is that there is a there is an uh, an M for this, which is one over epsilon, one over epsilon, not one over epsilon squared. So that if you look at S bar times the diagonal of, of V, this this characteristic vector, times the times this diagonal matrix S times S bar transpose, then the squared Frobenius norm of that is within one plus or minus epsilon of the squared uh, norm of V. So we have approximate norm preservation in a certain sense for V um, in this kind of setting in which we are multiplying on left and right by sign matrices. And, and this, uh, the M that we need is not um, one over epsilon squared, it's only one over epsilon you know, up to these log factors. And, and the, the upshot of that is that we can, you could use an M by M matrix to represent uh, a, as big a set as a map I VSA vector of dimension M squared can represent. So with, with the tweak of including this uh, diagonal, sign ma diagonal sign matrix diag of S, um, we basically have something which operates much like um, map I VSA. So I, I don't have an immediate, uh, interesting application of that just to note that you you continue you could continue to use this as a as a hot field network um, it doesn't this doesn't hurt you as a as a as a hot field network to conclude this 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 particular thing although um, uh, at least it doesn't hurt you with respect to the single iteration recovery although instead of having a um, a positive definite matrix s bar times s bar transpose you know, now have an indefinite matrix, but it's a very well-behaved indefinite matrix in an appropriate sense. So, so I've this is we've called this hot field plus or minus because of this this plus or minus uh, uh, vector uh, S that we're we're including, um, you know, or hot field PM, uh, which not to be confused with hot field that you use in the evening. Um, so sorry, but. Um, and I, 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 I want to leave uh, time for discussion, but um, I will just uh, point out that we also have results from map B. And now for, for map B, life is, 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 is more difficult with respect to analysis because we can no longer, you know, we no longer have that linearity that, linearity that allows us to, to use the single vector norm preservation property. So we're only able to do analyses of, um, of set membership in, in bundles and also um, some to some degree in, in for rotations and for bundles of binding. So we have we have some analysis of, of map B, certainly not at the same level of generality that we had before. Um, oh and 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 also, and I don't have I don't I don't know that I have too many slides about this. Um, so there is a there is a a, a Yet another kind of VSA, which, which is I think called in the in the VSA literature BSDC, but which in the in the algorithms literature is called Bloom filters, in which you represent set elements using sparse binary vectors. And here, you know, the the atomic vectors are are in, you know plus one or sorry are zeros and ones and. And uh, you know, generated generated uh, randomly and independently, and you you generate them k times, and so you have end up with a with a vector of of, of approximately k, or with the suitable operations, exactly k non-zero entries, and so and so you arrange those those vectors, those sparse binary vectors, into d columns, and now you have a sparse binary matrix which is M by D and it has entries which are zeros and ones. And, and, and um, a, a bloom filter then follows by, if you have a characteristic vector V, you multiply B times V, 
and take the maximum with one, or sorry, the minimum with with the with one. So you clip at one, um, or you you don't do that, and you have a counting bloom filter in which now you have in general integer entries in your in your vector representation, but you have a completely a, a linear operation, and and we also have. Um, an analysis of that, including an analysis for for set intersection, and um, you know showing showing how big the the sets need to be such that you can do estimation of the sizes of sets of a bloom filter, estimation of sizes of the intersection of two sets that are represented as bloom filters. So I think I will I will uh, skip over that and conclude. So. You know, we we the 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 initial the initial thing here was just that cl classic sketching results kind of more or less immediately apply theoretical analyses for map I operations, um, and you know for map I bundling, and then with with some more work, um, you know the the other map I operations, um, there is a connection of map B bundling to. Um, to Boolean function analysis, there is a whole literature of the analysis of Boolean functions, and and the analysis of bundling to some degree fits into that. Uh, it's, it's kind of also related to the analysis of voting because you're basically, you know, the, the key thing, the key question is what's the probability of a tie when you, when you have a whole bunch of random votes. Um, we have the observation that the order of operations. And the kind of operations is significant um, for for the analysis and and actually for you know the, for performance of these systems have have a uh, uh, something for uh, hot field networks and have a general more general you know have a particular new VSA scheme related to hot field networks and finally the the open question which I still have not been able to. Uh, uh, get an answer to is is that I it would be nice to have the, I mean there are a variety of binding operations for sparse binary rep VSA representations, but uh, to, to to my taste they don't they're natural whatever natural means and 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 it's certainly the case that they are difficult to analyze. So it's sort of the question is okay it's sparse binary representations do seem particularly related to. Um, you know, uh, biological neural networks, how are biological neural networks doing their binding? Or are they doing anything analogous to binding? And if so, how are they doing it? Um, or, or is there, you know, if, if forgetting about that connection, is there an efficient way to do a reliable binding operation uh, uh, that's r robust binding operation in that setting? So, I uh, apologies for kind of going over and yet not covering everything, but but that's life. Uh, so I I, I I I hope that there's uh, time and interest in some uh, questions. Thanks. Thanks very much for your attention. Ken, thank you very much for the great talk, indeed. So um, any questions? So I turn now my attention to the audience. Yes, please, uh, Gregor. Uh, hi. So I'm uh, very far from understanding the math. I, I looked at the papers far beyond what I know. This is a global question. So I understand that the work provides some proofs or so, so limits that estimate this capacity. Uh, right. Is it also meant to provide a way of how one could actually co reduce the computation that you would use the this um, sign matrix and and do the computation with with a much lower dimensional representation or is that not a viable use of this? So so I I, I suspect that the you know what what I proved is uh, I, sorry what we proved um, is 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 upper bounds on you know how how you know if if you have a di sketching dimension that's this big you know then it's good enough for you know for for you know such and such a a, a quality of, of, of computation. Um, there, there are also lower bounds for for JL, um, saying that uh, you, you know you, you can't get away with anything smaller, at least and you know and have and have it be entirely reliable. I would say that the that the you know the the possibilities for increased efficiency would more have to do with maybe these alternative um, 
schemes like uh, the you know the the fast uh, JL the the thing the the using the Hadamard matrix where um, you don't need to instantiate the the um, uh, the atomic vectors you know you can kind of kind of generate them very quickly on the fly and you generate and use them very quickly on the fly or the sparsity you know the the you know the the sparse JL would also uh, give increased efficiency but the it's specifically having the sketching dimension be smaller. I, in, in general, I don't, um, at least, at least kind of in, on a, on a, you know, on a, on a theoretical basis for, um, I, 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 I suspect that you will not be able to do better. Now, having said that the lower bounds are not for, you know, here we're, we're sketching um, characteristic vectors. We're sketching zero one vectors and the lower bounds, maybe, maybe they need the vectors that are being sketched to be general real real vectors. And so there might be something about the special case that we're in that would allow smaller sketching dimension. But I, I, I would be I would be pessimistic about that. Certainly, I, I, so I, I would I would also say that all of the log fact that I had various log cubed, log squared, log this, log that. Probably those factors go away, and and um, as uh, as I'm, I'm I'm told that the more kind of the breakthrough case for Hopfield networks was indeed kind of getting rid of that lo the log factor that was included in the analysis that I had, I'm, and I, somebody on the call might actually have been the one to point that out to me. But uh, so so thank you if you if you're there. But uh, uh, so, so you know these the log factors definitely are you know, could, could be gotten rid of, but, I, but no, I'm, I, this analysis in and of itself doesn't necessarily tell you, I mean, I mean, I think to, to me, it kind of might give increased confidence that, that you do all of this stuff and you actually get the answer that you, you know, you hope to be getting when you're done, you know, that you're, you know, you, you, you don't kind of, kind of run these operations and hope for the best. You have something that tells you, that indeed, if you know, with you know, within certain limits, that you are actually going to get the correct answer. So, yeah. all right, my more comments, questions. I'd, I'd love a little pushback about the binding operation for sparse binary, but uh, um. Maybe that's not. Uh, um. Um, I I have maybe uh, uh, very simple to, uh, in your your question. Uh, I mean, these bounds that you found. Uh, do you have more practically usable kind of a calculator where you can plug in some parameters and it will give you um, an estimate of dimensionality? Say? Yeah, so 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 I'm I'm not sure that I put in the in the paper included. I you know is, I mean it, it, there isn't a kind of news you can use in the sense that that I, I could probably you know per, perhaps they, the results could be phrased it, it, consistently um, as they are occasionally in terms of the sizes of the stats. But 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 it is it, it's also true that I'm I suffer from the usual curse of. Um, you know, sort of theory theory results, which is that there's that big O notation, and and I while I I don't I'm fairly confident that the associated constant factor isn't you know gigantic. I don't have a solid handle on what that um, you know on what the constant is either. So I can't I can't put it as sort of um, what what I just try try to in some sense promise, which is to say that you know if you have a vector of you know, uh, of size, you know, 9,530, and you are representing a set of, with a ground set of, you know, such and such a specific size, then with, you know, this particular probability, you will be, you know, you will, you will be safe. Um, so, so these results are, you know, pointing in the direction of, of provably good performance, but still, there are there's those those constant factors. In some cases, I probably could actually, you know, work through and say what the constant factors are, 
In other cases, you know, maybe maybe not. Um, and in any case, all of those the all of the bounds are conservative, and so um, it's true that you know you would be safe if you use them, but you know you you would probably also be safe if you use something you know five times smaller or something. You know, I can't I can't really promise anything in in in, in that respect. So it's not it's not quite you, news that the practitioner can use, but you know, we, we do what we can, so. And to jump in again. So yeah. did you or your colleagues ever try numerically to, to sort of check out if it works in some examples? So uh, I, I think, I think, I think Elizabeth did a, did some, did some analogy, does some experiments along those lines, but, but in, in general, um, uh, no, yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't done kind of a systematic, you know, that's there, there should in some, you know, for many purposes, there should be a part of this paper was, which is, well, we did the theory. And now here's what we get, you know, empirically, experimentally, and, and we haven't done that. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're diligent theorists and lazy experimenters, I guess, which, you know, uh, you know, uh, bad on us, but yeah. So. Okay. More questions? Okay. Let's see if, uh, let's give another chance, last chance. For okay. Us and then, uh, Very good. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to people offline uh, yeah. as well. So if you contact me and I will, uh, as, I, as, we, as I mentioned when you ended, well, I'll make the, the PDF of the slides available as, as, as well, and which yeah. might be more useful in the paper. And I will publish, uh, for, uh, publish it on the website. Okay. Uh, so okay. uh, along with the video uh, recording of this talk right. so uh, Ken once again thank you very much for coming and giving this uh, great talk it was thank really, you uh, great and um, so for all thank you for coming and see you in two weeks on the next VSA online webinar see you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. thanks thank you very bye. much thanks bye okay.